Imagine a world where you could look into the eyes of the magnificent woolly mammoth or share a beach with the mysterious dodo. Well, soon, you may just be able to do that. A company by the name of Colossal Biogenetics has made it their mission to bring back extinct animals in an attempt to repair broken ecosystems and to prevent global warming. Shortly after the company was founded in September 2021, they released a detailed plan on why and how they were going to bring back the woolly mammoth. They even went as far to say that they would have the first woolly mammoth hybrid calves by 2027 and will reintroduce them to the Arctic tundra habitat to restore the mammoth steppe grasslands and to combat climate change. Since then, they announced their project to bring back the dodo and recently announced their goals to bring back the Tasmanian tiger. But in today's video, we'll be taking a look at why, when and how they will be bringing back the woolly mammoth. Please enjoy. Just before we start, what is your opinion on de-extinction and do you think it can change the world? Leave your ideas in the comments below. Colossal Biosciences was founded by George Church, a renowned geneticist, and Ben Lamb, an American entrepreneur. The purpose of the company, as quoted on their website, through technological and engineering breakthroughs in biosciences and genetics, Colossal is accepting humanity's duty to restore Earth to a healthier state, while also solving for the future economies and biological necessities of the human condition. Colossal will revolutionise history and be the first company to use CRISPR technology successfully in the de-extinction of previously lost species. On the journey, we will build radical new software tools and technologies to advance the science of genomics overall. Before we delve into the actual process of bringing the woolly mammoth back, let's have a look at where it all started. George Church is the co-founder and lead geneticist advisor for Colossal. He is a professor at Harvard and MIT, runs the church lab at the Harvard Medical School, and is a core faculty member at the Wies Institute at Harvard, where he leads the synthetic biology platform. Church is a recognized leader in genomics, having pioneered a few advances and breakthroughs that have helped advance the entire field. In 1984, with Wally Gilbert, Church developed the first direct genomic sequence method and barcode multiplexing tags. This led to automation and software used for the first cellular genome sequence in 1994, which evolved into the in-situ sequencing in 1999 and next-generation sequencing in 2014. Church then pioneered chip-based DNA libraries, genome editing, and stem cell engineering. He also pioneered new privacy, biosafety, human engineering, environmental biosecurity, and bioethics strategies and training. Today, he and his group champion open access human genome data. For his achievements and direct contributions to genomics and the sciences as a whole, Church has received numerous rewards some of his most prestigious recognitions include National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, the Heptannual Boer Awards, and prize for the achievement in science from the Franklin Institute. You're probably wondering, how is such an ambitious company funded? And what are the foundations that are already in place? According to Bloomberg, the evaluation of the company, which has raised a total of 225 million, is now $1 billion. I'll link a source here showing the companies that have invested. Colossal Biosciences has established a Scientific Advisory Board, Executive Advisory Board, and a Conservation Advisory Board. They've also appointed a Head of Products, HR, Device Engineering, Marketing, Animal Reproduction, Species, Finance, Stem Cell Biology, Paleogenetics, Embryology, and a Head of Biological Sciences, who is also the Head of the Mammoth Project. Now we know this company is for real and they have prepared carefully with the correct leadership for this project, let's look at their reasons for bringing back the woolly mammoth. But before that, we'll briefly touch upon the extinction of mammoths and what influence humans had in it. Mammoths lived all the way up until 3,670 years ago. The evidence is clear that humans lived among woolly mammoths and even considered them a big part of their lives. Most of this evidence comes from caves across today's countries of England, Spain and France. 
The most notable example of mammoth and human interaction was found inside the Raffiniac Cave, located in the mountainous area of southwestern France. Inside the cave, known as the Cave of a Hundred Mammoths, are more than 250 paintings and depictions along the cave walls, etched into the stone by humans who called the cave home during the Mesolithic and Neolithic periods. Also found inside the cave are mammoth bones and tusks, fashioned into a number of uses, including tools, art objects, furniture, and burial items. Mammoths and humans lived amongst each other, and perhaps humans relied on the mammoth as a part of their equation for survival. It is also quite clear that us, along with Neanderthals, helped to bring out the eventual extinction of this important creature. There is evidence that humans harvested mammoths as a source of protein, used their tusks for art and other luxuries, and employed their bones and tusks in the construction of dwelling structures. Given their massive size and slow reproductive rates, many believe that human hunting was one of the few major causes of the mammoth's extinction. Along with humans, natural climate changes caused a shrinking of the mammoth's available living habitat spaces. The animal was forced to live in tighter areas of land, causing the genetic pool to shrink, and problems related to inbreeding eventually began to occur. Eventually, the planet's mammoth population was reduced to two small communes of about 500 to 1,000 each, one on St. Paul Island, just off the southwest coast of Alaska, the other, Wrangell Island, off the northeast tip of Russia. The Wrangell Island mammoths existed up until about 4,000 years ago and disappeared quite suddenly, with evidence pointing towards human hunting expeditions as the likely cause. Greater biodiversity and healthier ice reserves provide evidence that the Earth was in a far better environmental state at the time of the woolly mammoth. Without human intervention, there was no artificial pollution no land degradation resulted from a mass expansion of destructive agricultural practices, natural resources still in abundance, an absence of overhunting, overfishing, poaching, and more. A key factor was also the presence of the thriving mammoth steppe, comprising of flourishing Arctic and tundra regions. These landscapes were vast and responsible for playing a balancing role in the planet's overall state. The mammoth's massive size, thundering gait, and vast migration patterns were active benefactors in preserving the health of the Arctic region. The mammoth steppe was once the world's largest ecosystem, spanning from France to Canada and from the Arctic islands to China. It was home to millions of large herbivores, and these animals were key to protecting an ecosystem so vast it affected, if not almost controlled, the entire climate. The loss of these large, cold-tolerant mammoths over the past 10,000 years has stripped this ecosystem of the grasslands that once efficiently absorbed carbon. Instead, there are mossy forests and wetlands, which aren't as helpful with combating rising temperatures. However, if the mammoth steppe ecosystem could be revived, it could help in reversing the rapid warming of the climate, and more pressingly, protect the Arctic's permafrost, one of the world's largest carbon reservoirs. Re-establishing an ecosystem filled with grasslands will help to recreate a cycle that prevents the thaw and release of stored greenhouse gases within the Arctic permafrost. With cold, tolerant elephant-mammoth hybrids grazing the grasslands and roaming comfortably during the winters, they would scrape away layers of snow so that the cold air can reach the soil. This allows the grasslands to thrive, and since they are lighter than forestries, the snow won't melt as quickly making way for another benefit, a surface that reflects the sun's radiation. Arctic permafrost is a Pleistocene-aged soil that remains completely frozen at zero degrees Celsius. The Arctic permafrost formed during the Pleistocene era, sometime between 1.8 million and 10,000 years ago. Permafrost contains a significant amount of organic material, with an ice content of 50 to 90% volume. The trapped Arctic permafrost carbon is the result of gradual decay of plant, animal, and microbial biomass that has accumulated over countless years. The current stores of 1.6 billion metric tons of carbon equate to more than twice as much carbon now in our atmosphere. Even more alarming is that 65-70% to 70 of trapped carbon lies within the surface layer of the Arctic permafrost between 0 to 3 meters deep. And obviously, as the planet warms and the permafrost melts, it will release all the carbon into the atmosphere, which will then result in further warming. 
In Sakha Republic, Russia, introducing animals into Pleistocene Park has proven to reduce soil temperatures at 90 centimetres depth by up to 8 degrees Celsius. Animals that have been introduced to Pleistocene Park are Yusian horses, musk oxes, yaks, moose, bison, Kalmyhan cows, sheep, goats, reindeer, and Bactrian camels. So how does the woolly mammoth add to the work that's already done at Pleistocene Park? Woolly mammoths will aid in changing the plant topology of the mammoth steppe to resemble one that existed only 10,000 years ago by knocking down trees and shrubs and making way for fast-growing grasses and forbs. Fast-growing grasses and forbs have deep diffuse roots, unlike the shallow roots of the tundra trees and shrubs. The deep roots of the tundra grasses and forbs have a greater efficiency for carbon uptake which results in enhanced carbon capture and storage. Another way the mammoth will make an impact is by trampling snow as they move and forage for food, resulting in a more compact snow layer. A compact snow layer reduces surface insulation from very low winter air temperatures, enabling colder and deeper winter soil freezing. With the reintroduction of mammoths into the Arctic tundra, the permafrost will have a colder annual soil temperature driven by the enhanced winter freezing. Lastly, the grass and forb dominated ecosystem that the mammoth will enhance gives rise to a more reflective surface than the current shrub and forest dominated tundra. The snow will fall in a uniform layer and more surfaces will be exposed to snow cover, resulting in an overall increased reflective surface that bounces sunlight back into space rather than absorbing it, allowing for cooler annual soil temperatures. So how do we even begin bringing back the woolly mammoth? First of all, you need woolly mammoth DNA. Woolly mammoth remains have been preserved remarkably well, even across millennia. Thanks to its habitat in the permafrost, tundra and frozen steppe regions, many mammoths who died never fully decayed, instead staying sealed in ice for a later discovery, meaning the tissue samples collected contain intact DNA, undigested food in the mammoth's stomach, fur, tusks and more. The Asian elephant is the woolly mammoth's closest living relative and therefore has the most genes in common with it than any other living animal, sharing 99.96% of DNA, meaning that any lost DNA from the mammoth carcasses can be filled with DNA from Asian elephants. So in a sense, it's not a true mammoth, but will walk, sound, smell and behave like a woolly mammoth, so the difference is completely unnoticeable. Once the DNA work is done and all the foundations are in place, mammoth fetuses will be placed inside female Asian elephants and eventually birthed and initially raised by the Asian elephants. Their mothers will also teach the young all their elephant ways and on the ground animal behavior specialist teams will provide additional support. Given the woolly mammoth genomes are genetically modified derivatives of the Asian elephant genome, the woolly mammoths will retain many of the same genetically encoded behaviors including intuition for navigation, foraging, and survival. Woolly mammoths were highly adaptable, traveling across a range of latitudes. Much like modern day elephants, they had a far ranging migration pattern, adapting their diets and behaviors to the different climates they encountered. Their remains have been found as far south as the Shandong province in China and Spain. The woolly mammoths will also naturally evolve to adapt to their environmental context through genetic and epigenetic changes. Highly adaptable in terms of its dietary and behavioural habits, the woolly mammoth fed on both grass and small, nutritious flowering plants called forbs, such as poppies and buttercups. Much of this flora survives today. As for the ecosystem changes that did take place right around the time of the extinction of most woolly mammoths 10,000 years ago, these were likely the result of woolly mammoth extinctions, not the cause of it. This change in vegetation may have also caused some fires since the vegetation megaherbivores used to consume may have served as kindle. Similar trends have been observed following the megafaunal extinctions in the American Midwest, Madagascar and Australia. Reintroduced to the Arctic, the woolly mammoth would thus help restructure the plant communities through its feeding behaviours. In addition, its faeces would fertilise the soil, nourishing a rich floral landscape in turn, keeping the animals healthy and thriving. Once the woolly mammoths are ready to survive on their own, they will be released into a minimum of four areas, called mammoth hubs. In collaboration with the Alaskan government, Colossal will pick the best locations for rewilding, based on a number of factors. However, 
Since the primary cause of rewilding is combating climate change, the locations were first selected for being noted as areas with permafrost, which are keeping high carbon deposits locked in place under the frozen crust. An additional factor in determining placement of mammoth rewilding hubs is the avoidance of disturbance of other keystone species. Once the mammoths are in a diverse and thriving population, they will then be introduced into other parts of the world, like Pleistocene Park. The work that is being done here is nothing short of amazing. Once the mammoth, dodo and Tasmanian tiger are successfully released back into the wild, who knows what else we can bring back? Maybe one day, in the not so distant future, we will once again share this planet with another species of human. Thanks for watching today's video. I loved covering this topic and still find it unbelievable that it is truly a possibility. If you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to leave a thumbs up. And if you have any suggestions for future videos, then please leave them in the comments below. Have a good one.